to Truth For Life. Today, Alistair Begg presents a unique message, a biographical look at one of the great preachers of the 20th century, Martin Lloyd-Jones. This message was originally preached at the annual Basics Conference for Pastors and Ministry Leaders. We're hearing it today as a part of our series called The Pastor's Study, Volume 3. You know that you can do medicine, but how do you know that you can preach? That was the question that his fiancée posed to him as Lloyd-Jones anticipated the transition between uh, the work of a respected physician to becoming a minister of the gospel. Lloyd-Jones's position was that having graduated from medical school, he was one of the brightest and the best. As a result of that, he was handpicked by Lord Horder, who was then the physician to the royal family, whose uh, main uh, responsibility was to the prime minister and the members of the cabinet and to the uh, highest elements of society. And when this individual looked out for a young graduating medical student, uh, he was attracted to this fellow, this young Welshman, Lloyd-Jones, and so called him to work in partnership with him. On the day after his 27th birthday, Lloyd-Jones received an invitation from a man by the name of Mr. Reese, E.T. Reese, who was the secretary of an essentially a sort of evangelistic mission hall that was called the Bethlehem Forward Movement Church. Earlier the same year, the previous minister had left this particular congregation uh, with his health in poor repair and with a broken heart. The context was difficult to say the least. The church secretary, who is to be commended for his honesty, forwarded a report to Martin Lloyd-Jones in prospect of his coming to this church, in which he stated Sandfields, as the mission was known by locals, uh, it was his district name, Sandfields contains at least 5,000 men, women, and children living for the most part in sordid and overcrowded conditions. Almost 90% of these people do not attend any place of worship, for there is a gross indifference amongst the respectable working class, whilst a depravity born of sin enmeshes the great majority. The bookie, the publican, and the prostitute prosper here and directly challenge us. So that was the description of the context in which he was invited to come and minister and the place to which he accepted this call uh, so soon after his 27th birthday. When you look at this, there was clearly no earthly reason why this young, eminently successful, and with a great future in front of him physician, and his wife-to-be, who was also a physician, should actually set aside all of the prospect that was before them, all of the prestige and the security of London, to go to what was a very daunting prospect in Aberavon in Wales. Years later, in 1954, in the course of his expositions in Ephesians, he says, "'Whatever authority I may have as a preacher is not the result of any decision on my part. It was God's hand that laid hold of me and drew me out and separated me to this work.'" In the summer of 1926, as he walked the hills of Wales with his fiancée, Bethan, his wife-to-be, remembered how on fire he was to break through what he referred to as the rut of religious respectability, to tell people what Christianity meant, and to be in some, quotes, raw place where people were conscious of their need. Very interesting. And many of you will be on the receiving end, as I am, of letters from young men who are just completing seminary. And when they write to say where it is that they feel that they should be ministering, it really is a travesty, uh, as they describe the wonderful circumstances that they're looking to find with uh, multiple staff and uh, white-collar setup and, uh, and, you know, all of these variety of opportunities. Uh, very different from this uh, 27-year-old who says, put me in some raw place and let me see if God, by the preaching of the Bible is not going to affect radical change. You see, there was about Lloyd-Jones a growing sense and a genuine sense of self-forgetfulness. It was actually a hallmark of his ministry. He knew that he didn't want people to expect anything great of him, but that through the preaching of the Word of God, men and women would be struck by the greatness of God. He understood what others have said, that you cannot make much of yourself and much of Jesus simultaneously. Now, 
there are another couple of factors um, that I want to say just by way of introduction. First, that it is impossible to understand the significant impact of the preaching of Martin Lloyd-Jones apart from his very clear sense of call. The gospel ministry for him wasn't a new career that had been brought about by a desire to help uh, people in his native Wales. It was for him an arresting call. It was divine in its origin. It was relentless in its pursuit. And it was ultimately only explicable in biblical terms. He would have said that, for example, in Jeremiah 1, you must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Now I have put my words in your mouth. He would have said that while that was uniquely the call to Jeremiah, it was that sense of being shut into the will of God that so gripped him and moved him out and beyond medicine. And that actually is in large measure the explanation for the seriousness that marked his demeanor and his delivery. But his authority and his boldness and his conviction can ultimately be traced to the fact that he knew himself to be in the pulpit by divine appointment. His answer to the question, how do you know that you can preach, also tells us something very important about his view of preaching. Namely, that the preacher must first preach the message to himself. For unless he has preached the message to himself, then he has no right to preach it to anyone else at all. And Lloyd-Jones would say that the preacher must be uncovered by the searching gaze of the Bible, must be broken by its exposure of his unworthiness, must be stirred by the wonder that God has loved and saved him in spite of all that he deserved. And the preacher must be lifted up by the wonders of God's grace, thrilled with the Father's goodness, if he is ever to convey these truths with any sense of integrity and authority to those who sit in the congregation." We have nothing to say to our people till first the Bible has been preached to ourselves. And this, you see, was what weighed in upon Lloyd-Jones. The fire within the bones of Jeremiah is one that many of us have observed but so rarely felt. But when you listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones preach, there was a real sense that the reason that the message came in power through him was because it had first come in power to him. He wasn't lecturing. He was delivering a message. It was the oracle. It was the burden of God. So Campbell Morgan, actually, who preceded Lloyd-Jones at Westminster Chapel, was asked how he felt when he went into the pulpit. And he said, well, his stomach went round and round and round, and it churned. And the person interviewing him said, and do you think that there will ever come a time when you cease to preach? And he says, yes, I will cease to preach when my stomach ceases to go round and round and round like that before I do. This leads to a third observation, and that is that Martin Lloyd-Jones' preaching was God-centered. To listen to him preach was to be made aware of the greatness of God. And that explains, again, the sense of gravity that he brought to the conduct of worship. Incidentally, before we just jump over that, let me make an aside. To say that Lloyd-Jones' preaching was God-centered, we may jump over too quickly if we don't think about it. The the great lack in evangelicalism in America today is an absence of God-centered preaching, God-centered worship, God-centered evangelism. It's not that God isn't spoken about, but God is a means to an end. So people are sitting listening to pastors talk about God, but it's not God as an end in himself, having made himself known. It is God who is a mechanism for you to become the kind of father you should be. It is God who is the means to make you the kind of uh, fulfilled person that you want to be, rather than that people are caught up with the fact that this is a declaration of the wonder of God, and therefore the reality of man's condition before him, and therefore the necessity of a divine transaction to take place to transform the circumstances of people. And I don't think it is that people so much are able to identify that or necessarily articulate it, but when they go and listen to preaching like that, they know that it's different. They can't say, this is God-centered preaching, or this is whatever it is, but they just come out and they say, you know, that that isn't what I'm used to. There was something about that. What was that? Well, in Lloyd-Jones' case, it was that it was God-centered. Now, clearly, he had his own little predilections. He had some really distinct peculiarities as it came to the matter of worship. He had very little time for any falderal at all before he preached. He would often wear a coat and sometimes two coats because he found everything very, very chilly. And when the choir or they, when he was invited to preach in Glasgow by the United Evangelistic Association, and they would bring in a big choir and a bunch of things, he would just sit and he looked like he was completely, he looked as comfortable as a porcupine in a balloon factory. He just sat there and stared in front of him. It was as though he had no interest in it whatsoever. 
but it was simply because of his view was so God-centered. And it was so titillating, and it was so, uh, uh, such an endeavor to entertain or to employ a mechanism to create a mood or whatever else it is. He used to say, you know, and my dear friends, you go to these places and they sing in order to get the congregation into a, into a right frame of mind. And by the time they've got them into the right frame of mind, there's no congregation left to preach to because everybody has gone home. So he detested all of that. And he couldn't understand why somebody would stand up at the beginning of worship and say, Hello, how are you this morning? glad you're here, or hello, and everyone's supposed to go, hello. You know, like you just went to uh, Burger King or something, and, there was, and you were a greeter. So nice to have you. He couldn't understand that at all. In Preaching and Preachers, he addresses it straight up, preaching in Westminster Seminary in the first instance, which is now the book. He says, if the church were the minister's home and the people his guests... Then he argued it would be permissible to say, good morning, folks, nice to see you, how good of you to come. But he regarded that whole approach as wrong. Quotes, it is not our service. The people do not come there to see us or to please us. They and we are there to worship God and to meet with God. A minister in a church is not like a man inviting people into his home. He's not in charge there. He's just a servant himself. Now, that's a solid dose of rectification for most of our congregations, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't matter whether they feel welcome or not in the first instance. The real issue is, will God manifest himself in the context of worship? Now, that was what drove him. He was convinced that the main failing in evangelicalism throughout his life was man-centeredness. When I asked his daughter, Lady Elizabeth Catherwood, what stood out in her mind when she thought of her father's preaching, her immediate answer was, quotes, the sense of the greatness of God, his holiness and his love, a sense of awe. And she, call, she recalled how her father in his later years, when he was so notorious, when he was so well-known, when crowds would come from everywhere to hear him preach, he would address the congregation and he would say to them, just try to forget the little preacher and concentrate on God. See, he recognized the problem. I mean, he wasn't going to say, I know that the people are all here because they've got a great interest in God. He knew that they were there because God had given him a unique facility and he was an immensely powerful communicator of truth. And so he recognized that with that came a great burden, and so he had to admonish them. Now, listen, folks, just you forget about the little preacher and concentrate on God. In other words, he had about him the spirit of John the Baptist, since he viewed preaching, giving to men and women a sense of God and his presence. He would say, I can forgive a man a bad sermon. I can forgive the preacher almost anything if he gives me a sense of God, if he gives me something for my soul if he gives me the sense that he is inadequate in himself, that he is handling something which is very great and glorious, if he gives me some dim glimpse of the majesty and glory of God, the love of Christ my Savior, and the magnificence of the gospel, if he does that, I am his debtor, and I am profoundly grateful to him. That's good stuff. Incidentally, people from time to time would ask his daughter Elizabeth, weren't you afraid of him? And she laughed at that and described how kind and gentle and engaging and humorous and peaceful he was out of the pulpit. She described for me the happiness of Sunday evenings, sitting beside him as he read perhaps a Christian biography to, quote, settle himself after the burden of preaching. And as he would sit by the fire every so often, bidding the family listen to what he regarded as a helpful quote. There was not only a God-centeredness about him, but there was also a doctrinal clarity about his preaching so that his listeners were left in no doubt as to where they stood before God in light of eternity. His preaching was in direct contrast to the kind of preaching that was anecdotal, sentimental, entertaining, but powerless. His confidence was in the Bible itself. He was sure that the Holy Spirit would drive home biblical truth. When the preacher, he said, was, a, was himself a man taken up with the glory and greatness of the truth, then he would be emboldened to declare it fearlessly. If you've listened on tape to any of his evangelistic sermons, you will know that his pattern was almost the same, always. He set out the dilemma of man. He would talk about war and disease and hatred and jealousy. 
And then he would ask whether there were any contemporary explanations and solutions to fit the symptoms. Having pointed out that there were none that would deal with the symptoms, then he would move his listeners to the depravity of man and to the gravity of their sin. It was masterful. If you have his uh, evangelistic sermons from uh, Aberavon, if you have his Old Testament evangelistic sermons, the pattern is the same throughout. You know, it starts essentially from the, the, the local newspaper and says, you, you know, we're in a dreadful position here, and so on. Uh, the, the, the most classic I heard him do in his, in his company was on an evening when he preached on Psalm 8. And it was one of his favorite uh, passages. And he was talking about man and all of his greatness and stuff. And then he said, and my dear friends, do we not have a great illustration of the dilemma of man? He was talking about how man is glorious as an angel and yet is as dreadful as an ape, that he is capable of creating beautiful hospitals. He is capable of creating the most dreadful um, concentration camps. And then he said, but you only need to turn to your newspaper to see what I'm saying. And the English newspaper split, split the front page on the 18th of July, 69, between two scenes from, uh, that were produced from America the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon and the landing of the car driven by Teddy Kennedy in the Chappaquiddick. And he said, and there you are, my dear friends, we have a man on the moon and we have hell on the earth. Now, you see, you talk about the ability to move between the scriptures and the contemporary circumstances. He was masterful. Now, he moved from the lostness of man's condition to the wonder of God's redeeming love. His sermons were full of substitution, full of propitiation. He never shied away from the words. He broke them down and explained them to people. He was explaining them all the time. He warned his listeners not to think of Christianity in terms of imitating Christ. The message, he said, is not to look at Jesus as the great exemplar, the great teacher. It is instead, quotes, look at a gibbet, at a man with a crown of thorns upon his brow and an agonized expression on his face, crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A man dying in apparent weakness. That is what you're called to look at. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Realize that he was bearing your sins in his own body, that your sins were being punished in him, that God has laid your iniquity on him and has dealt with it there. This is all. You have nothing else to do but acknowledge your sin, to repent, to confess it all, and then simply to believe that Christ, the Son of God, has died for you and for your sins. And if you do it, you will be immediately saved. Amen. See? This is good preaching. <laughs> Frankly, some of us ought to just chuck it and preach right out of his evangelistic sermons. <laughs> I mean, we'd be doing the whole of North America a favor for some of our bumbling, stumbling, don't want to offend you treatises, you know? No wonder the average businessman doesn't sit up when we preach. All this dialectic, well, it's this, and I know this, and this, and then the guy goes, oh, forget it. You know, I wouldn't buy a vacuum cleaner from you, he's saying to himself. You can't even convince me of, of, of why, why it is that I would even pay attention to you. But you see, Lord John stood up, man. They, they, people were riveted. Now, it was this kind of preaching, he would say, that, that he had needed to hear, but that he never heard when he was a young man, living within the orb of Christian influence, and yet he was unconverted. He said he never heard anything that touched his conscience, convicted him of his sin, and made him see his need of Christ. Question, you know, sidebar, make a note in, your, in our notes. Is there about my preaching that which touches the conscience, convicts of sin, and makes people see their need of Christ? Is there that continually about my preaching so that unbelievers are stirred and that those who believe are confronted continually with the reality of the gospel, that we are gospel men, that we are so constrained by the wonder of God's redeeming love, that we find ourselves almost inevitably going there from any passage in the Bible, for the whole Bible is about Christ. Now, this was, you see, Lloyd-Jones. So there was doctrinal clarity, and there was also an accompanying sense of the power of the, of the Holy Spirit, with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. You see, this was his great thing. 
Why did I not come to you in this way? And why did I not come to you in that way, says Paul? No, I chose to do this so that your faith might be seen to rest on the power of God and not on the wisdom of man. And my preaching was not with this and not with this, but it was in a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Lloyd-Jones would have nothing of the idea that that had to do with the effectiveness of personality or the peculiar giftedness of an individual. No, he said, this is something that is divine and is unique whether the individual is a quiet person, whether their style of delivery is slow and methodical, whether they are lively and enlivened, or whatever it might be, God chooses to own all kinds of approaches and to make it a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And for that, he longed. He longed. And it was his conviction that the great need of the preacher was what he referred to as unction which is in the 21st century a kind of old-fashioned word. You can find books about it every so often popping up here and there, some recently and quite helpful. But he said unction is that somewhat that is impossible to define. But you always know when it is present, and you can usually tell when it's absent. That's actually a quote from Spurgeon, not from Lloyd-Jones. Because Spurgeon was about the same business. The sense of the anointing of God upon the preacher was something that MLJ coveted. Preaching, he would say, is theology coming through a man who is on fire. What led him to this was a true understanding and experience of the truth. Lloyd-Jones used to say that preparation was power. What he meant by that was not simply getting your notes done soon enough and reading them enough, but the whole preparation of heart and life and mind was was the key to power. That was what gave him fluency. That was what gave him authority. That was what gave him the sense of impassioned conviction as he conveyed these truths. Because he was ready in golfing terms, he was there, you know, in the early hours of the morning, and he's, and he's hitting pitching wedges, and then he's going to, you know, he's hitting sand wedges and pitching wedges and nine irons and eight irons and all the way down the line, so that when it finally comes the time when he's on the putting green, he's ready to go. He's not showing up with his bag at the last minute, charging in and relying on the fact that he had a great round three weeks ago. No, he is prepared for preparation is power. Some of us it would, would be uh, phenomenally more effective if we were actually prepared prepared. Are you still with me on this? Are you all right? You're listening to Alistair Begg on Truth For Life and a message titled, Martin Lloyd-Jones, The Preacher. Alistair will continue this study tomorrow. In the meantime, you can listen again, free of charge, at truthforlife.org. Simply look for the series titled, The Pastor's Study, Volume 3. You also have the option to purchase this study on CD or on a convenient USB drive. It's an easy way to listen at your own pace or to share the study with your pastor as a token of your thanks during Pastor Appreciation Month. At Truth For Life, our mission is to teach God's Word with clarity and relevance. Through these studies, we pray that God will move to convert unbelievers, to establish the faith of those who believe, and to strengthen local churches. As you listen... We pray that you'll be better equipped to serve your congregation, whether you're a pastor, a ministry leader, or a layperson. Toward that end, we've selected a helpful resource, a book written by David Murray titled Reset. Our culture often defines success by busyness. The more activities we're involved in, the more important or useful we may feel. But David Murray explains that God has a different metric for success, As you read, you'll learn how to break the cycle of busyness and live a healthy, grace-paced life before you burn out. And as you rest in God, you find that you'll become more productive in the things that really matter. Ask for the book titled Reset when you donate today. Your gift enables this program to stay on your radio station and on the Internet. We're so grateful for your partnership. Call us to donate at 888 588 7884 or give and request the book online at truthforlife.org I'm Bob Lapine. Be sure to join us Thursday when Alistair continues our study of Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's part of our series called The Pastor's Study, Volume 3. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.